A person is one will be number three hundred in the hymnal. And as Tom Hatch and Old Court, we can all sing. Praise him. Praise him. Let's sing. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Singing over his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest of angels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, he is the guard of children. In his arms, he carries them all belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him. Every joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. We are rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus of crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him. Tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, every joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with Hosanna's ring. Jesus, Savior, reign forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, fountain and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Our and glory. Unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Good morning. Good morning, Richard. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the many, many blessings you bestow upon us each day. Lord, we ask that you help us to be mindful of those and to continue to give you thanks for everything you do for us. Lord, we ask that you be with us now as we take this time to enter and study. We study through the book, the book of Acts. We ask to be with Adam and give him a living recollection of the things that he studied and prepared. And give us an open mind and an open heart, Lord, that we can apply these words to each of our lives and that we can be stronger and better and more pleasure to you. Be with us now, Lord, as we go into this time of study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 13, if you'd like to open your Bibles. Welcome, Carl.
I love to come in this room, lay down my Bible, put the notes on the table, and then just look at your faces. And I know what you're here for. Richard's counting heads and thinking, there could be a few more. I want to look at it a little bit different. Like people that are walking into a dessert shop. I'm looking at the glass and it's all lit up. Cakes and pies and fried things and baked things. And, you know, those things that ever expand the waistband kind of things. We get here for this hour. We're here in the dessert shop. Because what's in Acts chapter 13 is something that's very rich. Isn't that what you said about Acts chapter 12, Alan? It was something like that. And so these faces that are here are people that I know are part of my dessert club. Because we love what God is saying. We're looking this morning at a shift from Peter and the Jerusalem church that we have looked at in the first half of the book of Acts. We're about to make a pretty significant change. We won't get with Paul, Saul. We're going to get with Barnabas and Saul. We're getting ready to go on a journey. Acts 13 records the beginning of what we usually call Paul's first missionary journey. First, there was a formal commission given to Barnabas and Saul. We'll see that in just a moment when we read. Then there's a record of their efforts to sow the seed of the gospel there on the island of Cyprus. Next is the record of John Mark's defection and the movement of Paul into that region called Asia Minor. Then follows the record of Paul's address in Antioch of Pisidia. Not the same Antioch they came out of, but a different Antioch. We've got to keep our Antioch straight. Just like when you're in the New Testament, you've got to keep your John straight. Because John the baptizer and the apostle John are two different people. And the record of his second sermon in that same city on the Sabbath day one week later. And how the people are responding to this because they've walked into the dessert shop too. And they're getting that feeling of, does God really care about us in this way? Is he really involved with us in that way? And we walk into this chapter and we look at this because we get the feeling of God's paying attention in that manner, at that level to me and my needs and my struggles and the things that I'm going, we're going to deal with in the glade seven days a week. And when you look at these folks in Antioch of Pisidia, and you get the idea that's true for them, you can make the application, that's true for us too. And that's when the wow starts to form in our minds and it comes down and settles into our hearts. Wow. And the journey that we have been on throughout our lives we look at these and we say, that's just incredible. Moore looked at this and he said of this trip they're about to make, the travel adventures, the near escapes from death, the courtroom dramas, the tension of antagonistic opposition. By any account, what we are about to read is a riveting story of the beginning of the church. And we know in Jerusalem on Pentecost Day, when the Spirit's poured out, that's the beginning of the church as we know it in the New Testament. But for these folks, it's the beginning of the church for them. And it's really an important picture for us to be able to look at together. Many of the modern missionary principles that we practice today come from the journeys that Paul and Barnabas and, and Paul and Silas made around the Mediterranean. In the first missionary journey, we're going to learn about the Holy Spirit as the primary sending agent. The church in Antioch that they come out of 
is a serving church and a praying church and a fasting church. And the Holy Spirit's active there. I was a young preacher. Dare I even say the town and state? I'm not going to do it. I almost got fired one morning between Bible class and preaching the sermon because I mentioned the Holy Spirit. We in churches of Christ have been a little standoffish about the Holy Spirit because of some churches and their abuse of the Holy Spirit. He makes you do this and he makes you do that. And he and he's scary. Well, I think it was Nathan quoting C.S. Lewis in his Bible class last Wednesday night or the one before. I'm sure it's a privilege to get to be in the Wednesday night Bible class once in a while here. But Lewis described God as he's not a tame lion. He's lion-like. He's not tame. And the Holy Spirit's not tame either. And so he, he does things like we're going to see this morning. First three verses of Acts 13. Now there were these prophets and teachers in the church at Antioch. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius the Cyrenian, Manon, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, Tetrarch from childhood, and Saul. And while they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work which I have called. And then after they had fasted and prayed and placed their hands on them, they sent them off. All the lessons from Scripture. There's an example of what they're doing in this church right here that is a very spiritual thing. It is so spiritual, it makes me uncomfortable. The simple word fasting. I don't really like that word. Because I know what it entails. 1980, could have been early 1981. I was in a church in Lubbock, Texas, in a school in Lubbock, Texas, and I had a discipleship class. And the teacher was purebred Irish, and he thought like it, and he talked like it. And lo and behold, disciples need to know how to fast. <sighs> we had papers assigned, we had lectures assigned. And we had in that class fasting assigned. There was a little church I was baptized into here in Tennessee, two counties over. We didn't talk about fasting and we didn't practice fasting. I had to say, what is it and how do you manage to do that? You actually go without eating. This was a fasting church because they wanted God to hear the prayers of their hearts. Not just the words of their mouths, but the prayers of their hearts. And if you take the desire to eat and lay that thing aside, Leon, just so you can pray, you must really be serious about your prayer. Like I said, that word makes me uncomfortable to this very day. But they taught us how to fast. Even fasted for a week during that period of time. It won't kill you. It will clarify your thinking. And it does let you see the world in a different light when your body steps past hunger. And all you focused on are the spiritual things that you want God to lead you in. And this church was like that. They weren't being babies about it. They were looking and saying, Lord, what do you want us to do? So this group of men in these three verses that are mentioned here are important. Not only because they were teachers in the church in Antioch, but since they were prophets. These men named in this verse were the official 
prophets of the church in Antioch. What does that mean? Well, to the fullest extent, they had the prophetic gifts given to them to help lead this church to be what God wanted them to be, to do what God wanted them to do. What do we have that guides us in that? Got one of these? I know you do. Well, this tells it. Yeah. I'm getting phones flashed at me. We're such an old folks church. Just for those of you listening on YouTube, I didn't really say that. Because we're not in heart. I got more people here flashing the text on their phones than they do on paper with ink printed on it. I love to turn these pages. You all know, just hit your buttons and flip the chapters, all right? This is what guides us. What did they have? They didn't have any iPhones, they didn't have any Androids, and they didn't have Thomas Nelson or Moody Publishing making Bibles for them. They were living those days. And that's why God had prophets in the church to say, the Lord is saying to me, to say to this church, and this is how we need to do this. They had a Bible. It was called the Old Testament. Don't tell me not to teach the Old Testament in our church. It's inspired too. God let that lead us also. We may not be making any animal sacrifices this week. He's changed things a little bit. But it's inspired too. They had teachers teaching and prophets prophesying. And the men named in this verse had that full gift and were regarded along with the apostles as being foundational. In the establishment of the church. You ever gone to church and learned something that you didn't know before you walked in the doors? Yes, we have. Well, I was working for a mission organization. We called it One Nation Under God. We were trying to put the gospel into every home in the world, into the heart language of all the people of the world. So it required some traveling and it required some fundraising. I was in a church in Ohio one day. And this truck it wasn't a new truck. It wasn't shiny. It didn't have big mag wheels on it. It was an old guy's truck. And the guy got out, looked like he was about 73. And he had long gray hair about down to here. Real pretty. And I couldn't hide my surprise as a younger man. I said, who's that? And the preacher said, that's our prophet. Well, I had learned something that day. This church in Ohio had a prophet. You're wondering where I'm going with this. It's just a story. It's just an illustration. Officially, he was not a prophet. But when he showed up in that town and started going to this church, he told them he was going to be their prophet. Self-proclaimed. That's not like this. He had some long gray hair and a wispy beard. And wanted to be thought well of. These folks, like the apostle, were listening to God. They were teaching what God wanted before the New Testament had been codified and, and, and printed and collected. And decided this is the new covenant that God has given us. Ephesians 2 and verse 20 says... As God's household, you are built on the foundation of the apostles. We got that from Acts chapter 2. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. We've talked and talked that one. You're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as cornerstone. The prophet thing. It kind of throws us into a tizzy once in a while. We have to stop. We have to think about it. Because of all the churches I've been in, that one in Ohio with its prophet is the only New Testament prophet I've seen. And I'm going to chuckle about that just like you. He was a sweet old man, and he didn't have too many harebrained ideas. But that one. These prophets, 
that are described here in this verse in the church at Antioch had their purpose. And as Paul said in Ephesians 2 and verse 20, that Christ the cornerstone, that's what they're standing on. Just like the apostles, that's what they're teaching. The apostles' task was to say, we saw him and we saw him die and we saw him resurrected. And they taught by the Spirit. And these prophets taught by the Spirit also. What do you think was the chief produce of these prophets? Yeah, that's a real talk to me question. Thank you, Joe. They were called by the Holy Spirit. They worked by the Holy Spirit. Yes. They were gathering souls. Ah. They, like the apostles, were in the business of gathering souls, early says. Good observation. I'm going back right here. I think this is the chief produce of the prophets. God spoke to men throughout the time, inspired them to write the Spirit's Word so we'd be guided. They did serve the church in their day. But their main thing was to say, this is the Word of the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. So this is the fruit of the prophetic ministry of the New Testament. New Testament time. Because the prophetic fruit is the New Testament. Carl. The original understanding I had of a person who was a prophet was not necessarily somebody who prophesied the future. But who spoke for God. Yes. So I consider you a prophet because you speak for God. And maybe that's what that other man intended in Ohio, but it got led off in other directions because there was prophesying of telling you the future, but the most important part of the prophesying, prophesying was speaking the word of God. I think you hit the nail on the head exactly. In prophesying, there is foretelling and there is forth telling. Yes. And I think in Antioch right there, they were doing more forth telling than they were foretelling. Not that God didn't give that. We know Paul, as he's coming back from one of the missionary journeys, one, Agabus, I believe it was, stands up, takes his belt, ties it around Paul's wrist and says, you're going to be bound if you go to Jerusalem. And Paul basically said, well, don't get in my way yet. Because God's called me to go. And so these guys are forth telling the word so the church will grow. So the listing here, we start with Barnabas. Barnabas, the uncle of John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Mark was the son of Mary. Barnabas was Mary's relative. That was the house that we looked at last week in chapter 12 when Peter was freed from prison by the angel that he ran off to. Family house for Barnabas. Simon that was called Niger. In this context, we have the phrase of Cyrene. It's understood by those that really understand Greek. I define Greek words for you. I talk about the Greek meanings. But some of the finer points, this one anyway, is lost on me. They said that, that Cyrene, as you look in the original text, is a modifier both of Simeon and Lucius, the next person named. And it adds probability to the supposition that this man is the same Simon who carried the cross. I look back at that again. Mark 15, verse 21. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country, and they, the Roman soldiers, forced him to carry 
the cross of Jesus. It was after Jesus had stumbled. He'd been beaten and beaten and abused, and he carried that cross until he couldn't carry it anymore, and he fell. Simeon called Niger. Niger means black. Could imply that he is a black-skinned African. It might be just the word black, like a surname. Shirley Temple. You remember Shirley Temple? I heard tap dancing. I was tap dancing with a girl. Zoe Grace. The next thing in her horizon is tap dance. Because when you take them to ballet class around here, it's ballet and tap, or ballet and jazz, or ballet and hip hop. We're not going to hip hop. Granddad just decided that. <laughs> And so she's watching Shirley Temple the other night, tap dancing in one of those old movies. And she's with the butler, and boy, it's amazing how the butler could tap dance. We're going up and down the steps, and she says, I want to do that. So Grace sitting there saying, I want to do that. But when Shirley Temple grew up and got married, her name became Shirley Temple Black. So as I've read the commentators on this Niger thing, it means black. One guy goes to so much energy, puts so much energy into saying, this is not a black person. It's just like a surname, like Shirley Temple's name was black, but she wasn't a black person. And then other people look at Niger and it means black and say, it's very descriptive. And I look at it and say, if you're next door to Africa, and that's where the Holy Land is, right above Africa, you could have people in the church in Antioch, you can have people in Cyprus, that are people of black skin color. I wouldn't argue to say it's not a person who has black skin color, like some commentators. And as I look at those making this argument of he's a black person, he's not a black person, there's a whole lot of racial background stuff in the arguments. And I'm just thinking it's ridiculous because if you're white or if you're black, Oh, brown, God loves you. That's right. So it's to me, it's not, it's not here or there. Mind you. Let's say he's because of their nearness to Africa, that he is a black man. He's a prophet and he's a teacher in his church. That's what's important right here. Who's next? Lucius of Cyrene. Falsely identified by some commentators as Luke, the writer of the gospel and writer of Acts. I think this is a different Lucius. It's a Latin name, so he's likely a Roman, since from Cyrene, probably one of the founding members of the church in Antioch. Then there's men. Hey, this is interesting. He grew up with Herod the Tetrarch. This is the Herod that beheaded John the Baptist and the hair that was over one of the trials of Jesus. And he grew up with his hair. Now in the Greek, it can mean several different things. It can mean that his mother was Herod's wet nurse, that they were like that, or it can mean their childhood companions. But the text says he grew up with it. Interesting that one of Herod's fellows is a prophet and teacher in the church in Antioch. I think that's fantastic. And then we come to Saul. Luke's, Luke's placement of Saul at the end of the list emphasizes the relative importance of these men in the church at Antioch. But this also enables us to see more clearly the dramatic rise of Saul as co-companion to Paul as leader of these missionary journeys. Paul, the greatest missionary of all time. There's nobody that's done what he has done. Nationally, these five men represent Africa, Syria, Cyprus, Cilicia, and Israel because of their diversity of wealth and race and cultural backgrounds, these leaders 
could represent all the groups within the church at Antioch. There's nobody that's left out that doesn't have a shepherd they can go to that understands their circumstance. Have I said anything that's raised a comment or question in your mind? No, the Tetrarch is a description of a ruler. As as far as uh, the finer points of defining the word, I didn't come thinking I'd be doing this, but it simply is a description of a type of ruler. The Romans, when they would roll into a place and they would impose their will, they would look at who, who's in charge and they'd let the ones that they could keep in charge that would rule in a peaceful way for them, they'd leave them in charge. But they'd also bring their own officials and put them in. Sometimes they'd call them king. Sometimes they could be tetrarch. Sometimes they'd be referred to as governor. And they all had slightly different meanings, but it still boiled down to the same thing. You're ruling in my name in this place to keep the local officials, keeping things peaceful. The Romans had lots of conquering to do. And once they conquered, they wanted to see a place being peaceful so they could go on and acquire their next territory. And the more with just a group of soldiers left behind that they could see peace maintained, the more soldiers were free to go on with their desires to conquest. We do have a Herod the Great, and we have King Herod, and we have a Tetrarch here. Slightly different, but doing the same kind of thing. Anything else? Appreciate that, Joe. He says, set apart for me. It's the Holy Spirit saying that. But the Holy Spirit in saying that is representing the Almighty, the Father, set apart Saul and Barnabas, or actually in this context, it's Barnabas and Saul, for me. For God, they're going to serve. They're doing the service of New Testament priest. Well, well, and you're talking about prophets, and that can make us uncomfortable. Now you're going to talk about priests. I am. The word, well, let me read to you Romans 12, verse 1. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. Or the word can be used as, translated as in New King James, your service of ministry. It's painting a picture of what the priest in the Old Testament did before the Lord, when they would come into the holy place and the most holy place, These people are also serving God like the people served in the Old Testament, in the temple, the tabernacle also. We don't have the same temple. But the book of Hebrews teaches that we do have New Testament priests. And it is me, but it's not only me. It's you. Well, Hebrews teaches that we who make up the church as brothers and sisters, his children, we are his priest. And instead of bringing showbread or oil to pour on a sacrifice that's being getting ready to be offered as a burnt offering, Romans 12 and verse 1 indicates that what we're presenting to the Lord is our living sacrifice, ourselves. And what's being said right here of Barnabas and Saul is set them apart for me. 
this word that's translated in the newer translations as set apart is sanctified. Sometimes you see it in King James, sanctified. Sanctified literally means set it apart. There are some things when Paul's describing this, when the Hebrew writer also is describing this, that are set apart for common use, and some things are set apart for special use. If you're having communion and you have a special set of communion things that have been set on the table that somebody's bought specially, they may be made of, of silver. And then you've got somebody that comes along with wooden broom with straw on the end of a stick, and when communion is over, you're sweeping the crumbs up off the floor where people have been uh, a little bit untidy with their bread, and you drop crumbs here, there, and the other. One's for special use, one's for common use, it's the same word, sanctify, set it apart for the use that it's intended for. And he says, set apart Barnabas and Saul to minister to me. Because I've called them. So here's the Holy Spirit, that manifestation of God, saying Barnabas and Saul are set apart or sanctified for me for one special purpose. This is a personal calling. They had a personal calling, and I believe that all Christians have a personal calling. And we hear him, and we're led to do the different things we do in his name. So for the he says they've been set apart for the work. It's related to a specific task that God has chosen, and this is a sin. They're being sent out on a missionary journey. You're sending to be different. It might be being sent next door to somebody that's grieving. It might be being sent up the street or somewhere else to somebody that is living like a heathen that doesn't know about the good news of Jesus that you get to take the message to. We have sendings. As to the exact manner of how the Holy Spirit communicated this, I'm going to deduce it's coming through one of the prophets right there. You got all these guys who are teachers and prophets, and the Spirit lays on their hearts, set apart, one of us and Saul. I've got a word for you. Thoughts? Well, I skip over a bunch of stuff because time's going by real quick. Becky? I think that it's real um, telling that the church in Antioch, there were five of these prophets that they had, and they sent two of them to the church in Antioch. The last two of them didn't have any connection to the church in Antioch. They didn't clear out the church in Antioch. They left to support them for that church while they sent others on. Antioch is the second largest city that they're going to serve in. Other than Rome, Antioch's the biggest city that we have talked about in the, in the development of the church. And I think it's also interesting that they sent Barnabas, who everybody thought well of, mm -hmm. and was, was, you know, had an impeccable reputation. Mm -hmm. And Saul, who there probably was still some little question, and he didn't have the, the, not the knowledge and background that Barnabas did, but he outshined them maybe in his writings and Later, different you know, training Saul, together, different training different hearts different thoughts different presentation we've been in a transition period right here in the last two years when Paul got up and announced that he's going to be retiring in full and not going to be teaching some of us knew that he was going to make that announcement. The church didn't know. I'll never forget. I'm still getting at that point to know you from afresh. Nancy came out. She came up. With both her hands, she took my hands and she said, I love them so much. She had tears in her eyes. It represents the bond that a minister had made with a sister that he had made with all of this church same kind of bond they have so what you're commenting on as far as there's five and they only send out two 
But you can bet as they're getting ready to go, there are sweet people coming up saying to Barnabas, oh, we don't want you to leave. Oh, we don't want you to go. A, a mild selfishness, but a sweet selfishness also. It was a love expression. We understand that in the church. We get those kind of relationships with one another. We, we, we share time together. We work together. We suffer together. We grieve together. So you can bet that they had some of that, but God didn't leave this church without his teachers and prophets. I'm taking two, but I'm going to leave you with three. God, we know God already had a calling on Paul's life. Remember Acts 9? The Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. That's Acts 9, verses 15, 16. So, it's not all just a joy ride when you're serving the Lord. And since we're all his priest in his church, when we suffer, we're like our Savior because he suffered for us. We have things in our lives that we would rather not have in our lives. We look back at him in the garden saying, Father, if you can take this cup away, I'd appreciate it. But then we have the opportunity to be like Jesus and say, but if you won't. And I'm not thinking if you don't. I'm thinking if you won't, that he has a purpose for not removing it. And I will be done. Just give me the strength to make it something I do to glorify you. So they're getting ready to go out. He's commissioned them according to verse 3. Oh, I'm looking at that clock, wishing I had another five minutes. I'm going to crunch it in together here. Yeah, it says 9.44. I'm saving folks from breaking your necks turn around and look at it. <laughs> They fasted again. They're pleading to God when they fast. What are they pleading about for Barnabas and Paul? What, what do they need? Carry the word and I'm sorry, but fruitfulness. Let's see that. Let's see this be a fruitful mission. Safety, health, your glory. There are a lot of things for them to fast about. And they, this is a fasting church. They did it. They sensed an urgency about this and a need to reach out to God in this special way. And so they did. Judging from the response that God sends, I'd say they're praying a whole lot about the need to spread the gospel to the whole earth. Because when they come back, they're going to report success. Prayer goes hand in hand with fasting. As much as in my honest weakness, I tell you, I don't like fasting. I've done it. And it's not impossible. It even feels good once you get into it. But when you're on this side about it, of it and you don't do it regularly, I tell you, you're thinking, oh no, not again. Thank you for not getting tired of me using Zoe Grace as an illustration. Yesterday, she's thinking about today's lunch after church. I think we should do this. Oh, I think we should do that. She's like her granddaddy. He likes to think about lunch after church. Mm -hmm. And so they are giving up something that's very important to the human situation. Where's my next meal coming from and what's it going to be? And it's all to say, Lord, please listen to us. If you're going to take these two from our fellowship and you're going to send them out, would you protect them and make sure that's successful. 
the church is participating in their sending. It's not just God saying go. The church is doing it. They fast. They pray. They lay their hands on them. It's not to give them any qualifications in the church there. They already have those. It's to enter into partnership with them in a, a symbolic way of saying, we're sending you out in the name of God to represent Jesus and to represent us. Go with our blessing. That's what it means when they lay their hands on And this is the first time in the record of New Testament that we see a church supporting missionary for missionaries plural. It's the right thing to do. We all don't go. We got work to do around here with people lost around here. We got work to do around here with worship. We got worship. We got work just shining his light in this dark world. But some of us don't go. And some of us are going to take part of what we've earned and help those missionaries to go. Their work's going to be the word. And we're going to put their bread on the table. They're going out to share spiritual bread. And when we support missionaries, we're helping them have the physical bread they need. Have their electricity turned on wherever they're living and all those things. And so what we're seeing in the text here is just an, a mirror image of things we experience today. And so there's where we're going to stop. We'll uh, we got as far as the church ready to send them. And next week we'll head off on the first missionary journey. Your comment or last question? All right. Thanks for your attention and your participation. Pick up next week starting with first four.